Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, NVIDIA's got another lawsuit on its hand. The Comet Lake S availability and uh, the lack thereof is a topic we'll be talking about as well. We got some commentary on Intel on when to expect additional Comet Lake S CPUs in the 10 series of Intel's new CPU launch. Ace Attack doesn't understand math, apparently is something we need to talk about as well. Uh, Microsoft going back on its old comments about open source being cancerous. So they've they've changed sides at least a little bit. ASRock and BCLK overclocking for non-K Intel chips and some additional stories. Before that, this video is brought to you by MSI and the Z490 Unify ITX motherboard for Intel 10 series CPUs. The MSI Z490 Unify ITX board benefits from a memory layout that makes memory overclocking easy, positioning the board well for enthusiasts who want to tinker on a bench or in an ITX system. The MSI Z490 Unify runs 90 amp power stages, a 10 layer PCB, and seats the memory as close to the socket as possible, all of which benefit the overclocking experience. Learn more at the link in the description below. First up, really short update on the GN mouse mats. It's insane to think that it's only been a week since we announced these, but we lined up all these videos with the announcement and some additional notices and like the news videos, and they were gone. So I thought that we ordered six months of inventory of these based on previous sales numbers for the other stuff we've sold. But apparently, people really, really like these, which is awesome, except we sold out within 48 hours. So my apologies on that. We do have them on back order. We are getting more in. It was not a limited product and is not intended to be a limited product. So we have another order in manufacturing now. It's just that it was much sooner placing this order than we thought it would be. So that's obviously a great problem to have on one side because it sold well and that's good for us and supports the channel. And then it's obviously a little bit annoying on the other because we don't have inventory to ship out. So if you got your order in, then it is on the way. You should have gotten a shipping email or you will get one in the next couple of days. Our warehouse guy is extremely busy. And if you couldn't get it in in time, then uh, you can back order these on store.gamersnexus.net. And we have information on that page of when the back orders are expected to come in. So it's in manufacturing. Thank you for the tremendous support. We're really happy to see all the people on Twitter who've been sending us photos of their mat and their setup. So when you get it in, feel free to tweet it at us. And if I see it, we'll retweet it out. And uh, the other thing is it's made me realize all of our audience has a better setup than I do personally because everybody seems to have four monitors. And I'm sitting here with one and an FX 8370 at my house, like apparently some kind of peasant compared to the rest of our audience. So anyway, really cool to see all that. Thank you for the support. Comment like ass availability update, a quick update on this. We spoke with Intel regarding the availability of the new CPUs in the 10th generation. This is something that we're trying to do more as products launch, especially in the silicon families, because as you all likely know, typically when a new CPU or GPU launches, the availability isn't always there, or it's a paper launch, or it's just not clear when its stuff is coming out. We followed up with Intel on this and asked, What's the deal with the CPUs? Intel said, quote, the unlocked 10th gen processors are coming to market first, including the Core i9-10900K, Core i7-10700K, and Core i5-10600K. The 10th gen Core i3-10100 and 10th gen Core i3-10300, as we're going to call it, uh, are expected to be available shortly after the 10th gen unlocked k SKUs. Furthermore, Intel told us that it would keep GN updated on the availability of the i5-10600K in particular, because this is the one that, from what we've seen, our audience seems the most receptive to or interested in. So we're going to try and keep an eye on that one and when it's coming into stock. As for everything that's not a K SKU, no K designation at the end, that availability is later in the future. Intel is prioritizing its production on K SKUs, so those will be available first. The quantities of those we're not sure about. We did see that some sold out pretty much instantly, so it even multiple hundred billion dollar companies have the same problem we do apparently except there's a silicon but uh we're supposed to get more updates on availability over the coming weeks and it does look like k-skews first so if you want a non-k-skew the only one we saw that there was a 10 400 and the rest we don't know when they're coming to market next one ace Attack doesn't understand math for its radiator cart or is maybe misrepresenting its math if we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt Asetek is the company behind both desktop and data center liquid cooling solutions. It's been one of the largest. They've been dropped recently by several of the manufacturers in the DIY space as they venture out and do their own designs or get less scared of being sued by Asetek. And that means that uh, we've seen a bit of a change in how Asetek's been marketing and selling its products. It's huge in data center, still pretty big in desktop DIY. They make all the EVGA CLCs, all the NZXT CLCs. They've sort of been pulled off of the Corsair CLCs as it's gone to cool it, but they are still popular. 
So they've got a new design that's been trotted out aimed at being deployed for liquid cooling GPUs, particularly in restricted cases, as in computer cases. The new design is known as the RAD card. Presumably it's like some kind of surfer RAD card thing. We don't really know where the, maybe radiator, that might be it. As is probably obvious, given the name, the RAD card is a card with a radiator and it sockets into a lower slot. So this gives you all the looks of SLI without any of the lack of performance but probably a similar price. This includes a shroud and everything else. It sockets into a PCIe slot. The RAD card is being deployed initially as an OEM only option with specific deployment in Alienware systems. And that would be the Aurora R11 PC. You can see that there are two populated PCIe slots in the Aurora R11. And one of those is a 2080 Super. And then the other one is the RAD card. So that's got the tubing. It's kind of like a hybrid solution except it's in a PCIe slot and uh, uses a blower fan to get the air out of the, the case instead of a radiator in a standard 120 slot. So the short run tubing between them. Ace Attack lays claim to the following performance numbers. They say on their website, quote, with Alienware's liquid cooled 2080 Super GPU, you can reduce noise by up to 69% and GPU temperatures by up to 20%. Except you, you, you can't really do this mathematically. Temperature We've, done, we've been through this before. Temperature is an arbitrary scale. It doesn't start at zero. And uh, just to provide an example, 50 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Let's just strip the measurement, unit of measurement from it. Strictly numerically, 50 to 100 is a doubling or a 100% increase. Let's convert that to Kelvin, which will give you the same temperature, the same energy, ultimately, that's being talked about here. You convert it to Kelvin, and now you're at uh, 323. 0.15 to 373.15. So now your scale is a 15% increase, despite the actual, like if you touch it, it's the same. It's going to burn you just as much as if it were measured in Celsius. And it's going to burn you just as much as if you call it a 100% increase versus a 15% increase, because it's an arbitrary scale. It doesn't start at zero, at least for Celsius and, and Fahrenheit. So this is not really an accurate way to market it at best. And it's actually just wrong at worst. Uh, you really, if you want to use percentages to talk about thermals, it should all be converted to Kelvin, but that's not how people work or do things or perceive temperature. So it's not really going to work that way either. It's just best to not use percentages at all when talking about thermals. But Ace Attack, a cooling company that specializes in thermals, decided this is what they're going to do. So uh, the percentage, if you convert to Kelvin, certainly wouldn't be as high as 20 and wouldn't look as good. So they're probably using Celsius degrees Celsius. As far as a noise reduction of 69%, uh, this also means absolutely nothing to anyone beyond the meme status. We don't know what unit of measurement they're using for noise. It's just out there, just 69% reduced noise. Uh, so if it's decimal, de decimals, decibels, then that's logarithmic scale. And it's not, it doesn't, you can't really just do like linear math for it, especially with percentages. Uh, we don't know what they're using for that, but either way, especially without knowing how far away the measurement was taken and what conditions it was taken, uh, it doesn't mean anything. So bad marketing for a product that actually looks interesting is unfortunately the, the, the alternative name to our channel, but it was too long. The RAD card is currently OEM only. Ace Tech teased on Twitter that it may not stay that way. It does look like a genuinely interesting product and is one we'd like to test but the marketing is up there with Zalman. Next one, ASRock, B-Clock Frequency Boosting for non-K Intel CPUs. We've been hearing rumors for some time about the possibility of overclocking non-K SKUs on Intel CPUs, and not only on the new Z490 ASRock motherboards, but also on select B and H series motherboards. While the rumors were a bit vague, they pointed to the concept of increasing the B-Clock rather than the CPU multiplier. This is something that is absolutely not new. B-clock tuning's been around for ages. And you could do it also on non-K CPUs, sort of, in the past. But it's always been a bit limited. So here is where ASRock's doing something a bit different. The idea is that with the 10th gen CPUs and on the non-Z motherboards, critically, ASRock wants to be able to fulfill the uh, option of doing some overclocking against what looks to be like Intel's desires. At this point, what we do know is that ASRock indeed has a base frequency boost feature called BFB technology, something ASRock is using, and they built it into its 300 and 400 series motherboards 
via new BIOS updates. What exactly ASRock is doing to make BFB work is a bit nebulous, and it will probably remain that way. If we were to venture a guess, it likely has something to do with tweaking the PL state on, uh, on the CPUs. So in a leaked image, it was clear that ASRock was able to force a 70-watt CPU to operate as if it were 125 watts allowed uh, PL. So this would obviously have implications for your cooling solution. It's also subject to provoke the unwanted ire and gaze of Intel. And that's a point that even ASRock has apparently accounted for. Quote, due to future hardware firmware updates or other reasons, the availability of BFB is subject to change without further notice or without notice in advance. That's what the fine print says, and it's denoted with an asterisk over at ASRock's BFB page. This isn't the first time ASRock has done something like this. Typically, if you want to keep an eye on controversial motherboard manufacturers who do cool things that are against what Intel and AMD want, the companies to keep an eye on are ASRock and then probably Biostar. Those are the two companies that do the most sort of gray area stuff that Intel and AMD don't want them to do. And it often gets patched out. But if you can get the board early, and if you get that version of the BIOS, and you don't care about microcode updates later or GSA updates for AMD, then you get a cool feature that other people aren't gonna have. So for now, it seems like base clock overclocking for the non-K Intel chips on ZH and B ASRock motherboards is a go, uh, until it's not. We'll see what happens. We're a bit skeptical that Intel won't nuke this with a firmware update that would have been all but guaranteed pre-rise in any way. Intel has long held overclocking as a luxury that's worth paying extra for and limited as a feature to the most expensive letters in the alphabet, which obviously, the, the most expensive and rarest of letters would include K and X. That's a good one. X is way up there. That's one of the most expensive letters, actually, because if you've noticed, when companies put X in their product name, the cost is higher because actually, not a lot of people know this, but it costs more to print the letter X on a box or a product. The, when you talk to the factories, if you add an X to it, the price is way higher because it's hard to do. So those are the most expensive letters, and that means that overclocking is limited to those because it's a special feature. So we'll see if Ryzen and the Ryzen effect has changed Intel's stance to make them less aggressive towards motherboard partners for going sort of in un uncharted territories. But that'll be determined in the near future, assuredly. ASRock currently has a list of supported Z, H, and B motherboards that have BFB through BIOSes that are available now or shortly. Next up, NVIDIA lawsuit. NVIDIA has allegedly been disguising crypto revenue as gaming. The suit against NVIDIA dates back to 2017 with a class action complaint filed early last year, and it seems to be gaining some steam. The new information here is that the class action complaint has been amended to suggest that NVIDIA obfuscated as much as $1 billion in cryptocurrency revenue by disguising it as gaming revenue. The reason for this, allegedly, was because NVIDIA knew that the crypto mining boom wouldn't last. This would have painted the false picture that NVIDIA's massive revenues at the time were insulated from the unpredictable volatility of crypto mining, thus misleading investors and shareholders if true. This also would have suggested that NVIDIA's gaming segment would have been more profitable and bigger than it actually was at the time, again, potentially misleading investors. The complaint specifically names NVIDIA's senior management. That would include CEO Jensen Huan, CFO His Jacket, and then also uh, CFO Collet Cress and SVP Jeff Fisher, the culprits allegedly behind what was going on. So shareholders at the moment are seeking damages for what the shareholders maintain are violations of the federal securities laws. And as for how this plays out in court or more likely gets settled outside of court, we'll follow up on it once we have more news. But this has already been in the system for a long time now. Next up, TSMC cuts off Huawei as the uh, US regulations grow stricter. The US Department of Commerce recently announced that it has an amended export rule and it's aimed directly at Huawei and its wholly owned chips design arm, High Silicon. The amended export rule dictates that any foreign chip makers using American IP technology or equipment will have to apply for a license before shipping to Huawei. And last year, waves were made when the U.S. added Huawei to the entity list, essentially blacklisting them from doing business with U.S.-based companies. Key suppliers like Arm and Google quickly retracted their business with Huawei. And despite this, the Department of Commerce asserts that the company has continually undermined the entity list. 
Quote, despite the entity list actions the department took last year, Huawei and its foreign affiliates have stepped up efforts to undermine these national security-based restrictions through an indigenization effort. However, that effort is still dependent on U.S. technologies, said Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. Ever since the entity list actions, TSMC has been caught in the middle of the geopolitical spat between the U.S. and China, with pressure on the chipmaker over its relation with Huawei. Huawei is TSMC's second largest customer behind Apple, so it quickly became apparent as to why TSMC was reluctant to sever ties. However, in response to the amended export rule, TSMC has now apparently halted all orders from Huawei per Nikkei Asian Review. Uh, quote, TSMC has stopped taking new orders from Huawei after the new rule change was announced to fully comply with the latest export control regulation, a person familiar with the situation told Nikkei. This news comes as TSMC formally announced plans to build a 5 nanometer mega fab in the state of Arizona. Microsoft confirms that it was on the wrong side of history. They've conceded with the open source debate. Microsoft has officially admitted that it was wrong about open source. And mind you, this is the same Microsoft that had former CEO Steve Ballmer, yes, the, that one, the one who jumped around on the stage, developers, 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 that one. And uh, he infamously called Linux, quote, a cancer that attaches itself to an intellectual property or in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. And that, quote, didn't age very well. In a webinar hosted by MIT, Microsoft commented on this. The president and chief legal officer, Brad Smith, said that, quote, Microsoft was on the wrong side of history when open source exploded at the beginning of the century. And I can say that about me personally. Smith went on saying that the good news is that if life is long enough, you can learn that you need to change. True enough, and it's not really fair to say that this is the same Steve Ballmer-led Microsoft of the early 2000s. It's also hard to forget Microsoft's sketchy history, especially in regards to its war with Linux. But Microsoft has since turned some corners in regards to open source projects. Most recently, it announced its Fluid Framework, a system seemingly aimed at taking the collaborative cloud software crown from Google Docs, and that is supposed to be going open source. There's also Power Toys, a suite of tools for power users resurrected from Windows 95 and updated and developed for Windows 10 under the MIT license. It's free, open source, and hosted on GitHub. There's also GitHub, by the way, the Git-based collaborative code repository service that Microsoft acquired, which it uses for its own open source projects. Smith even mentions Microsoft's GitHub acquisition as part of its commitment to open source. Quote, today Microsoft is the single largest contributor to open source projects in the world when it comes to businesses. When we look at GitHub, we see it as the home for open source development, and we see our responsibility as its steward to make it a secure, productive home. Perhaps most notably, there's also the Windows subsystem for Linux, or WSL, which is supposed to allow Linux and GNU distros for, uh, to be run in Windows 10 without the overhead of a virtual machine or a, a VM. WSL 2.0 is on the way as well. So while Microsoft was on the wrong side of history uh, with regard to Linux, or at least per its own words it was, it seems determined to not let history repeat itself or carry on. Whether you attribute this stance to a paradigm shift in Microsoft's leadership or to a paradigm shift in just computing in general, it looks like change is happening. Rumors up next. Early clock speeds for Ryzen 4000, as usual. These are rumors. We have not independently verified these specific ones, although typically we do try to get some verification in advance. Uh, this one we didn't verify independently, so whatever happens with it, we'll see if it's accurate. But a report coming out of Igor's lab seems to detail some early clock speeds for Ryzen's Vermeer upcoming processors, or Ryzen 4000. We talked about the Vermeer processors in some previous news stories, talked about plans for DDR5 for in, or for AMD, rather, and their upcoming architectures. And according to friend of the site, Igor, there are already Zen 3 CPUs in the wild with an A0 stepping. On Igor's site, igorslab.de, it looks like there's an early engineering sample that's potentially in the wild. The samples in question are 8-core 16-thread and 16-core 32-thread chips, respectively. According to the ordering part numbers, or OPNs, ascertained through BIOS entries, it seems early clock speeds for the 8-core 16-thread variant are 4.6 GHz boost and 4.0 base. The 16-core 32-thread chip seems to have a base and boost of 3.7 and 4.6, respectively. As this is no doubt very early silicon, these frequencies will almost certainly rise with the A1 stepping revision. At any rate, treat all of this with a grain of salt, obviously. This early in the process, this far before anything's announced, 
it's sort of dangerous to pin expectations on numbers that we're seeing early. They can change positively or negatively. Typically, it will happen positively because it's so early that you see more conservative frequencies. We've also seen it go the other way, though, where people en masse expected higher frequencies than have been realistic. So we're not sure how this will develop, but certainly Vermeer is the next interesting item from AMD to look at. And if you want more information on this, we encourage you to check out Igor's lab. De. We're happy to give him a shout out. He does fantastic work. A lot of it's in German, but he does often have a translated article as well that he's written in English. Intel is acquiring Rivet Networks, the company of killer Nick fame. The, the best Nick we've ever worked with. Never had any problems with killer before, except literally every time I've tried to use it. Intel has announced that it's acquiring Rivet Networks for an undisclosed sum. A little known fact is that Rivet Networks actually started life as Bigfoot Networks. It wasn't until Qualcomm acquired the company and subsequently spun it off a few years later that it became Rivet Networks. Intel reports that Rivet Networks team will be lumped into the Intel Wireless Solutions Group, which is itself a part of Intel's broader client computing group. Rivet Networks products and IP, such as the Killer brand, will roll into the Intel PC Wi-Fi portfolio. The driving factor behind Rivet Networks being spun off from Qualcomm was due to the Killer Nick brand stagnating under that acquisition. Since becoming Rivet Networks, the Killer brand has flourished and seen wide adoption with OEMs and motherboard makers. Anatech had a chance to talk with Rivet Networks and expressed concern in its discussion piece that Rivet may suffer the same fate under Intel. Rivet CEO Mike Covage will move over to be Intel's Senior Director of Connectivity Innovations, according to Anatech, seems to assuage some of those concerns. According to Covage, Rivet Network's strengths, both then and now, lie within PC and gaming. And at least in that arena, both Intel's and Rivet Network's goals are mutually congruent. So one could likely take the recent AX201 and Killer AC1535 chips as evidence of this. Rivet partnered with Intel on both solutions and we'll have the uh, additional information from Intel's newsroom and the Anatech article linked in the show notes document below if you want to read more on either of these. NVIDIA researchers reproduced Pac-Man using AI only. Just in time for Pac-Man's 40th anniversary in Japan, researchers at NVIDIA have faithfully recreated the retro classic with GameGAN. GameGAN is NVIDIA's neural network model that emulates games through GANs, or Generative Adversarial Networks. Based on two separate but competing neural networks, a generator and a discriminator, GameGAN can be trained to recreate games without an underlying game engine. And such is the case with Pac-Man. The recreation is the result of training GameGAN with some 50,000 episodes, a few million frames, apparently, of Pac-Man. Quote, this is the first research to emulate a game engine using GAN-based neural networks, said Sunwoo Kim, an NVIDIA researcher and lead author on the project. We wanted to see whether the AI could learn the rules of an environment just by looking at the screenplay of an agent moving through the game. And it did, ends the quote. The GameGAN rendition relies solely on AI to recreate all elements and rules of the game. And it can be done through training the AI on screen recordings and keystrokes from past gameplay. The GameGAN version of Pac-Man faithfully honors both simple and not-so-simple physics and rules of the original. For instance, if Pac-Man runs into a ghost, the screen flashes and it's game over. Alternatively, when Pac-Man successfully exits the maze on one side, he's transported back to the opposite end. Just like the original, Pac-Man can't go through maze walls, and he eats dots and power pellets, replete with the appropriate effects. The research team used NVIDIA's DGX systems to train GameGAN, and the Pac-Man demo will be available over at AI Playground, as well as future GameGAN products. Furthermore, NVIDIA says that GameGAN isn't just about games, but has larger implications for how AI could be used in the future. Quote, we could eventually have an AI that can learn to mimic the rules of driving, the laws of physics, just by watching videos and seeing agents take actions in an environment says uh, Sanja Fiddler, the director of NVIDIA's Toronto Research Lab. GameGAN is the first step towards that, NVIDIA said. And that'll cover us for hardware news for the week. There's a lot of coverage on the channel as well about Intel's 10th generation, as they call it, of CPUs, the 10,000 series. We're not sure yet if it's the 10900K, the 10900K, the 10900K, or the 10900K, but it's probably the last one. So you can check out the reviews on the channel if you want to learn more about those CPUs. And we've got the 10700K either up by now or coming up shortly as well, so you can check that one out. Thanks for watching. You can back order the mouse mat at store.gamersnexus.net or the mod mats for that matter. They both sold out the same weekend. And subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out in other ways. We'll see you all next time.